All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Um, doing something a little different today, uh, but we've got quite a bit of interest, so um, we're we're excited to see how it goes. But we've got Adrian Messer, who is going to be taking us basically through everything our uh, Ultra Pro 15,000 can do, um, how it works, the applications that you can use it for, um, the reporting that you can do out of it. And uh, it should be really cool. So if, if that's an instrument that you have been interested in looking at, um, this should give you a pretty good feel for everything that, that it can do. Um, Want to let everybody know that while this um, session is taking place, I am recording it. And we'll get this up on our website later this afternoon. So if you have to hop off or if you want to share it with, with somebody else in your organization, that'll be available for you guys to look at. And we also welcome questions. So feel free to type those in throughout the presentation. Um, I'll be keeping an eye on those and I'll get those questions off to Adrian um, as it makes sense throughout. And then of course, we'll have some time at the end as well. Um, so definitely feel free to, to kind of participate in that way. It's good to try and keep these a little interactive if we can. Um, also like to always point out, you know, if we have any technical issues of, you know, we're doing this live, so if any issues with our internet connections or audio, you know, we'll we'll hop on trying to fix those as, as quickly as we can. So just bear with us and uh, hopefully we won't have any of those issues. Um, so with that, I'm going to change the screen over to Adrian and Adrian, we'll let you okay. get going. All right, let's get this pulled up here and, uh, and we'll get started. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Maureen, appreciate it. Uh, well, first of all, it's uh, it's great to be with you today. Um, always uh, love the opportunity to be able to uh, share information via webinar. Uh, these have worked out really well for us, and they've been very well received by our uh, users and uh, people who have an interest in ultrasound. Um, so, if you check out the on-demand um, training session of our website section of our website, you'll see that we've got dozens of uh, archived webinars on our website uh, on various topics, not all related to ultrasound and not all given by people from UE Systems. So uh, for this one today, um, you know, when I first started to think about what I wanted to do, uh, I didn't want to do just a standard, ordinary product tutorial type presentation. We already have an UltraProbe 15,000 product tutorial on our website. Uh, when we first released the UltraProbe 15,000, uh, we did a, a product tutorial type webinar and that's archived on our website. Uh, for this one, what I wanted to do, I wanted to focus more on the application. So I wanted to focus more on how you can set up the UltraProbe 15,000 for all the various applications. And uh, I have the, the, the great opportunity to be able to visit a lot of plants and facilities and meet a lot of people in maintenance and reliability. And, Speaking of applications, uh, when people are first exposed to ultrasound, one of, the, one of the things that amazes them is the fact that with the ultra probe, the same ultra probe that you use for compressed air leak detection is the same ultra probe that you can use for airborne electrical, is the same ultra probe that you can use for steam traps, the same ultra probe that you can use for bearings, the same ultra probe that you can use for valve testing. So. People are amazed at the versatility of ultrasound uh, and the fact that you can use the same tool for a multitude of applications. And so today I want to walk you through exactly how you would set up and then use your UltraProbe 15,000 for all the different types of applications. Uh, another point I'd like to make mention is, you know, because of the versatility of ultrasound, uh, you know, some of you on the call today may be in a plant or facility that's not currently doing anything condition monitoring wise. So you're not doing any infrared, no ultrasound, no vibration, no oil analysis. In those types of environments, ultrasound is a great place to start. And it's simply because we can use the same tool for a wide variety of applications. And in those types of environments, you can have some pretty quick wins and show some pretty quick return on investment um, because of the versatility and because you know we can use it for many applications. Um, and then some of you may be on the call today and maybe you're relying on contract maintenance to come in and do your condition monitoring work. So you have an outside service provider that comes in to do 
vibration analysis, or you have an outside service provider that comes in to do infrared scans on all of your energized electrical equipment. Um, even in those types of environments, ultrasound is a great tool to have in-house to use in between the times your service provider comes in to do that vibration analysis uh, or to do those infrared scans. So again, uh, from a versatility standpoint, or you know, if you're already heavily entrenched in vibration analysis, you'll see that ultrasound is a perfect complement to uh, other other technologies and um, the fact that we can use it and use it effectively in a pretty short amount of time. Again, a great tool to have. So where is ultrasound technology today? Uh, you know, ultrasound, uh, I've mentioned, is considered to be one of the most versatile CBM tools in the marketplace, and the UltraProbe 15000 is certainly a, a diagnostic type tool for uh, many applications. And therefore, ultrasound has become accepted uh, as a diagnostic tool for both mechanical and electrical faults. So with ultrasound, you know, we're not simply focused on listening, uh, it's not about what we hear, and it's not solely about the decibel level. Uh, where ultrasound is as a technology is we can record the sound of what it is that we're hearing, and we can then play that sound file back, and we can diagnose exactly what the fault is, whether that be electrical uh, or mechanical fault. So ultrasound has become a more diagnostic type tool. Now, if we think about the P to F curve, uh, which is one of the fundamentals of reliability, if you look at any version, any form or fashion of that P to F curve, you'll see that once we have point P, once we have that potential failure, ultrasound is the first technology that will give you an indication that there's a potential problem. Um, so overall DB is a great leading indicator of a, of a, of a problem. So if we're trending that decibel level, and that decibel level starts to increase, and based off of the amount of increase, either above our baseline reading or above the previous reading, we can pretty well guarantee and know what the problem is. So we go back to our uh, recommended alarm levels for mechanical type faults, for instance. So 8 dB above baseline represents, hey, it's time to be greased. You know, it's in a lack of lubrication condition. Or 16 dB above the baseline, represents the point now to where that bearing is in a failure mode that is beyond a lack of lubrication. So again, overall DB is a good leading indicator of a potential problem. Our quickest return on investment uh, is still through energy applications like compressed air and gas leak detection and steam trap inspection. Uh, when myself or any of our regional managers are out in plant facilities, it's pretty typical that within a few minutes uh, or a few hours, we can find and document enough compressed air, compressed gas leaks to more than pay for the cost of the equipment. So again, uh, still the most widely used application is compressed air and gas leak detection, and that's simply because it's the application where you can show the quickest return on investment. And again, the same tool that you can use for compressed air leak detection is the same tool that you can use for all these other applications. Now, what's really neat uh, about ultrasound is over the years, we've seen a transition to ultrasound being uh, an accepted and viable tool by a vibration analysts for the inspection of rotating equipment. Uh, when I first started with UE Systems back in 2003, some of the hardest people to talk to about using ultrasound for bearing type inspections were your 20 plus year vibration analysts who didn't want to hear anything about ultrasound. They didn't believe in it. They didn't think it worked. But over the years, um, it has been proven that, yeah, it does work. And some of our best users of our equipment are people who have vibration backgrounds. So over that 15 year period, it's been really neat to see ultrasound become uh, accepted and widely used by people with vibration backgrounds. I would say the second most widely used application for ultrasound is bearing lubrication. So using ultrasound to know when we've applied enough grease or if we've started to apply too much grease. Uh, and this has become a huge application for us uh, with the, the two grease caddy devices. And we've had a lot of people have a lot of success, uh, especially if they're having 
problems due to over lubrication. So uh, if you're in a planter facility with uh, you know hundreds, if not thousands, of assets that require lubrication, uh, if you're having a lot of failures due to either over or under lubrication, you can have a tremendous uh, payback just by simply using ultrasound for condition-based bearing relubrication. And then remote continuous monitoring. Um, the funny thing about remote monitoring with ultrasound is we've had remote access sensors and different uh, remote continuous monitoring sensors for years, uh, but we have more of those sensors in use in plants facilities across the globe now than at any time in UE Systems history. And, and per part of what's driving that is just simply accessibility to the equipment. So a lot of the equipment that you have in your plant or facility, you no longer have easy access to it due to safety or guarding uh, or just simply, you know, just inaccessible. Uh, so we have these remote access sensors that you can install on your equipment uh, so here we're showing uh, what we call the RAS or the remote access sensor. Uh, those are on varying cable lengths, so they're permanently affixed to the equipment, and then you run your cable out to an area that you can plug in directly to the ultra probe, or you can bring as many as eight together to an uh, eight-channel junction box, and then you just simply plug in from your ultra probe up to the box. And then those same sensors work with our new product called the UE Forecast, which will do remote continuous monitoring either, uh, and it'll take that data either hardwired through ethernet or wirelessly back over to our DMS and Spectralizer software. So again, uh, these are uh, great sensors to use on your mechanical equipment. Um, they're very economical. And you can install those, and if you need to monitor, you have, or if you have equipment that's inaccessible, it gives you a great way to, to then monitor that equipment. Um, and then also related to remote continuous monitoring, uh, one of our other sensors was recently showcased um, at the SMRP annual conference last year, and then also at our Ultrasound World Conference this year, uh, where it was the first um, time that I'm aware of where ultrasound was used for artificial intelligence and machine learning applications. And that was our UltraTrack 750 sensor that has a 4 to 20 milliamp output. So they were monitoring a steam valve going into an autoclave and the data from that 750 sensor was going into an AI platform uh, to do pattern recognition to, to see what that valve was doing. So if it was releasing too much steam or not enough steam, that could potentially affect the process. So uh, uh, and that's just one particular application, uh, and that same concept can be applied to other types of assets, other types of equipment. So it's going to be interesting to see in the coming years uh, how ultrasound can be used for uh, in Internet of Things types of applications. So um, it's kind of a fun time for ultrasound right now. All right, so uh, if you're not familiar with the Ultra Probe 15000, I uh, just wanted to give you a couple of slides, uh, overview of the features uh, and kind of how it works, and then we'll get into talking about the different applications. So as advanced as it is, it is very intuitive and very easy to use, and that's because of the icon-driven adjustments and features. So it is a, a touchscreen device. Uh, very easy to navigate, and you'll see some of the different screens uh, coming up in the next slides. It does have Bluetooth built into it, so uh, we do offer a wireless Bluetooth headset that you can get with it. Uh, kind of a neat, couple of neat stories about the Bluetooth uh, was that on, at a conference uh, last year, and uh, two different people came by, and uh, the first gentleman had hearing aids but his hearing aids had Bluetooth capability and he has an Ultra Probe 15000 and he said it was great for him because he just pairs up his Ultra Probe to his Bluetooth hearing aids. So uh, I thought that was a great example of, of how it can be used, uh, even people with, um, you know, uh, not so great hearing. And then a uh, second gentleman came by who was um, primarily doing some infrared scans of high voltage electrical equipment. And he said now because of the Bluetooth capability and having a wireless headset that he is now fully enclosed in his arc, arc suit, um, that he doesn't have to have, he doesn't have that uh, cable plugged into the headset jack anymore, you know, coming out of the suit, you know, he's fully now enclosed. So again, uh, a great application. So if you're doing 
Um, high voltage inspections to where you do have to suit up for that, uh, a Bluetooth headset would be perfect for you. Uh, and the 15,000 does have that built right into the, uh, the, the device. Now we can store up to 400 readings at a time and our uh, data is all stored uh, automatically over on the SD card, the removable SD card. Uh, if you have more than one route that you want to go out and collect data on, uh, you would just have multiple cards. So if you had four different routes that you wanted to go out at one time and collect data, you just have four different SD cards with a different route loaded onto each SD card. So once you're through collecting data on one, you just simply remove that card, put in another card with a different route. It's going to automatically load whatever route is on that card, and we can just continue on. So we have both. Uh, decibel level storage and onboard sound file recording. Uh, and again, uh, that's where we start to get into more of the diagnostic side of ultrasound is it's not just about what we hear, it's not just about the decibel level, but it's also making use of recording the sound of what it is that we're hearing. And then we can then play that back in the UE Spectralizer software. And that really paints a picture as to what it is that we're hearing. So we can identify certain bearing faults or we can identify is the electrical fault that we're hearing, is it corona, is it tracking, is it arcing? Each one of those have signature characteristics that will show up in either the time waveform or the FFT. Now we can also see that in real time uh, while we're out collecting the data. So when we go out into our FFT screen, uh, when we're ready to record the sound file, we actually see in real time the FFT and the time waveform. Um, now when we get to bearing inspection, um, one of the neat features about the Ultra Probe 15000 is when we load a route into it, where in, in that route we've established baselines, and if we have a sound file linked or attached to that baseline, it brings over that baseline sound file. So if we're out collecting data and we reach a point that's currently in alarm, we can actually do an on-the-spot comparison between the baseline sound file. We can play that back and then see either the FFT or the time waveform, and then we can compare that on the spot to the current reading. So again, a, another nice feature making use of the diagnostic side of ultrasound, you know, being able to, to see that FFT and then play back that baseline sound file. One of the uh, features that we'll talk about heavily during this presentation is the input data icon. So for each of the various applications, we can then input in application specific information right on board the Ultra Probe. We also have unlimited use of the UltraTrend DMS and UE Spectralizer software. Uh, we've never uh, charged, you know, license fees or, you know, charged for updates or upgrades to the software. You can go right to uesystems.com, click on products, and then click on software and manuals, and you can download the software right from our website. Uh, one thing I will say is when you go onto the website to do that, you'll notice that there are two versions of UltraTrend DMS available. There's 5.4.15, and then there's a DMS version 6. For most of you, you'll want the DMS 5.4.15. The uh, main difference between the two, uh, one, DMS 5 is an access-based software. DMS 6 is SQL-based. Uh, but also that DMS 6 is the one that communicates with the UE forecast. So unless you're using the UE forecast, I would say for most of you, you would need the 5.4.15. And then there's only one version of the Spectralizer software. And then the Ultra Probe 15000, again, works with uh, the remote access sensor. So you can take that sensor, plug it in directly to the Ultra Probe using the remote access module that comes with it, or you can um, bring those together to the junction box or the UE forecast. It's the same sensor. So some of the outside features, again, uh, starting here on the far left, you have your power button. So you just press and hold that power button and then you'll see the UE Systems logo come up. That'll let you know that the instrument's on. And then once it uh, is powered up, you'll then see the home screen, which I'm going to show you next. Of course, the headset jack and then the side view, we have the SD card slot and then the instrument trigger. 
Now, unlike the other ultra probes or some of our other ultra probes to where you have to keep your finger on the trigger, uh, with the Ultra Probe 15,000, the only time that we need to squeeze the trigger is when we're ready to get either the decibel level or the decibel level in temperature. So that's what um, that's what activates the uh, the dB and the temp. So here's our spot radiometer. So this is looking at it from the front. Uh, there's the spot radiometer. Here's a laser pointer, and then the camera with flash. Uh, now the flash uh, has been, we've enabled that now to be used as a strobe. So on some of your newer Ultra Probe 15,000s, you'll see uh, down on the, uh, below the sensitivity bar, some of the icons that appear down there. Uh, if you keep scrolling over, you'll see that there's a strobe feature. So uh, we can measure RPM if we need to, and that's using the uh, flash on the camera. Okay, so after the Ultra Probe powers up, uh, the screen here in the middle is the home screen, and that's the first screen that we're going to see. So then we have two ways that we can go out to listen or store data, and that's using the DB display icon, which is shown here. So that's going to show us just the decibel level only, or we can do DB and temp, and that's going to be here. So now we see the decibel level here and then temperature here. So again, two ways that we can then go out and listen uh, once we've turned the Ultra Probe on. So when we go out into the DB display, the instrument starts to listen. And then once we're ready to get the decibel level, that's where we squeeze the trigger. Now, if we squeeze the trigger and we don't see a decibel level, maybe we see three dashes here, uh, we need to adjust the sensitivity. So if we see those three dashes over here to the right of the sensitivity bar, we will see either an up arrow blinking or a, a down arrow blinking. So whichever direction that arrow is blinking, that lets us know that we need uh, the direction that we need to adjust the sensitivity. So we would just change or adjust the sensitivity using our finger uh, to either slide either left or right across this bar. And then that's where you'll see this S equals changing. Uh, and again, once we uh, adjust that sensitivity or bring it into range, that's where we'll then see the decibel level uh, here uh, right above the sensitivity bar. So again, squeeze the trigger. If we need to adjust the sensitivity, uh, you'll see the arrows pointing uh, in either direction, which way you need to adjust it. And then you'll bring it into range. And then that's where you'll see the, the decibel level. Okay, another important feature that I like to make note of is the instrument setup. So we have two ways. So if we go into the, the setup icon or uh, the setup menu, one of your uh, setups or one of your adjustments here is called the instrument setup. The factory default setting is in the manual setting. So the reason that is, is when we go out to take those initial readings, we're gonna be changing things. We're gonna be adjusting the sensitivity. In some cases, we may need to adjust the frequency. So we wanna take our initial readings in the manual setting. Now, before we load that route into the Ultra Probe again to take the next round of readings, we wanna change that instrument setup to automatic. And then when we do that, when we insert that SD card and it, we power it up, it's gonna automatically set all the same settings that we used when we took those initial readings. So it'll automatically set the application, the frequency setting, the sensitivity setting, uh, even down to the point of what module type we used. Uh, did we use the STM or the stethoscope module or did we use the remote access module magnetic? Um, so again, we wanna take the first round of readings, the initial baseline readings in the manual setting and then once we uh, download that back into the EMS, then before we load the route in, uh, to the Ultra Probe again, we just change the instrument setup to automatic, and then everything will be set automatically uh, based off of what we, uh, how we took those readings initially. So again, um, that's found in the setup, and then preferences, and then instrument setup, and we just simply change it from manual to automatic. Okay. Now getting into uh, each of the applications. So we're gonna start with compressed air and compressed gas leak detection. I mentioned that it's still the most widely used application for ultrasound, simply because it's the easiest thing we can do and then it shows the quickest return investment. So we can generate a report that will give us a dollar amount and a CFM loss to how much each one of those leaks 
are costing. Now, the minimum PSI that needed for ultrasonic leak detection is five PSI. So that's what the spec on our scanning modules are rated for, uh, and that's uh, at least five PSI. Uh, you get below five PSI, and there's just simply not enough turbulence uh, to create enough high-frequency sound that we can detect a leak using an ultraprobe. So again, we just need at least five PSI. And then if we're going to do reporting and cost calculations, uh, one of the factors for the formula used to uh, calculate the dollar amount and the CFM loss, we want to make sure that we take our decibel level readings approximately 15 inches away from the end of the rubber focusing probe. And the reason being is if we take the reading too close to the leak, it's going to tend to overestimate how much that leak is costing. So uh, when the research was done for this uh, many years ago, um, it was found that the optimal distance away that will get you as close to the dollar amount and the CFM loss uh, for that leak is approximately 15 inches. And that's going to be 15 inches away from the end of the rubber focusing probe. So just uh, something else to note there if you're doing compressed air and gas leak detection with ultrasound. All right, so we're going to enable the leak application. So going back, um, you know, to the home screen, uh, we want to go to the setup. And then when you go to setup, one of the icons that you'll see is the applications icon. So we would go there and enable the leak application. And what that allows us to do is that it's going to allow us to input in application specific information for each one of our readings that we take. So once we enable the leak application, we go into that DB display. There's no reason to take temperature readings, so we just want to do DB display. And then our recommended frequency setting for airborne ultrasonic inspection, whether it be compressed air and gas leak detection, vacuum leaks, or airborne electrical, is going to be 40 kilohertz. So if I need to adjust that, I just simply touch over here where it says, in this example, we see 40 khz. We would just simply touch that, and again, you'll see your either up, uh, your up and down arrows, and we can adjust that accordingly until we get to 40 kilohertz. We're still going to scan using the gross to fine method that we uh, have taught for years in our training classes on scanning in multi multiple directions, adjusting the sensitivity until we're able to uh, pinpoint exactly where that leak is coming from. Once we've confirmed the leak location, we're going to squeeze the trigger, adjust the sensitivity if needed to get the decibel level, and then we can release the trigger, and that will freeze or hold that information on the screen, and that will allow us to then take photos or uh, anything else that we might need to do while keeping that information on the screen. Okay, so then the input data. So the input data icon is going to be the one that looks like the little pencil here. So for each one of these historical readings, so right now we're seeing this uh, record equals one or REC equals one, that means I'm on record number one. And that's where we can have up to 400 of these if we want to. But for each one, I can input in application specific information for that point. So the input data icon, and then our options for the leak application are test results. So obviously, uh, if we detected something, then it's probably going to be a leak. We can input in the pressure. We can then specify the type of gas. Was it compressed air? Was it nitrogen? Was it argon, helium, or some other type of gas? And then we can also specify how far away we were from the leak. So those are your options for the input data icon. So if you touch that, then you would see uh, the options to specify uh, for each one of these uh, functions. And then we're going to save the data using the save icon. That's going to be the one that looks like the little disk here. And that's going to save all that information together, and it will advance forward to the next point. So in this case, it would say REC equals 2. Now, we can then take that data and then download it into the UltraTrend DMS software, and we can generate the compressed air and gas leak report. Now, we've made it even easier. So uh, just maybe a couple of years ago, we came out with a free download app, and this app is available in the App Store or Google Play. And if you look for UE Systems, one of the apps that you'll see is the Leak Survey app. 
So you download the app to your phone or your tablet. And we, uh, we see here, on, starting on the left, we see begin leak survey. Now we still have to have our ultra probes, so we still have to get the decibel level. So we just enter in the decibel level. We can type in a description, you know, location, where that leak is, the type of gas, the pressure. We can even take photos. And then once we're ready to generate that report, uh, you see up in the top right-hand corner, you have three little dots there. Get those three little dots and you'll see generate report. So you'll hit generate report, you'll name it, uh, call it whatever you want to. And then once you hit okay there, it will open up your email and that report will be attached to an email. You can then email that to yourself or to a colleague. And by the time you get back to your desk, you'll have a report waiting on you that will look similar to this. So this was a survey where we found a total of eight leaks and you'll see they were all compressed air. Uh, a couple of them, we entered a description of where it was. We specified the PSI. They, in this case, they were all 75 PSI. Here's the decibel level reading. And then uh, for this one, I believe the cost per kilowatt hour, which you would enter in down here on the cost tab, I think it was around seven cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, but those eight air leaks were costing this facility almost $4,400 per year. And again, this is all generated right from the app. Uh, you'll see that you have a tab for the pictures. So if you want to uh, take a look at the photos of, of where those leaks are, uh, that's where they would be found. Uh, but again, uh, great, easy way to, uh, to do compressed air and gas leak reporting. Now, the next energy application will be steam traps. Uh, again, uh, depending on how many traps you have in your facility, uh, depending on what your cost of steam is, so how much it's costing you to generate a thousand pounds of steam, uh, this is another application where you can have significant uh, return on investment. Um, so it's another energy application. Uh, what's gonna be important with testing steam traps with ultrasound is we've gotta know the trap the type of trap that we're testing. So trap identification is going to be critical because based off of what type of trap it is, that will determine what it's supposed to sound like. So your sound characteristics for steam traps, if you have an inverted bucket, uh, a disc, or a thermodynamic, those are going to be on and off. So we'll actually hear those traps cycle. Uh, you'll hear them open and release, and then you'll hear it shut back. Your other sound characteristic is continuous flow, and that's going to be a floating thermostatic. So that trap, that type of trap will never shut completely off, but because of that ball float that sits at the bottom of that trap, and because that level of condensate is changing in, inside of the trap, that creates a modulating type sound. And in some cases, you can actually hear the float operating inside of the trap. And again, if you hear the float, that lets you know that the float is in there working and doing what it's supposed to do. And then we have a, stim a similar cost report uh, that currently right now is the, the only way to generate it is with the UltraTrend DMS software, uh, but a similar report that will give you a dollar amount for how much the trap is costing if it's either leaking by or failed open. And, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you exactly what you need to know to generate that report. So if we're going to, if we want to do steam trap testing, um, we go into the setup icon and we go to applications and we select the steam application. So once you do that, then when you go out into the DB and temp display, you'll see here uh, where it says steam and you'll know that the steam application is currently enabled. So we want to do the DB and temp display because one of the things that we need to know to generate the report is the inlet temperature and the outlet temperature, and both of which we can enter in and store right on board the ultra probe. Now the recommended frequency setting is 25 kilohertz. So we want to make sure that we have it set to 25 kilohertz, and then it's a contact application. So we'll have the STM or the stethoscope module or the contact probe uh, inserted into the ultra probe. Now, for the UltraTrend DMS, uh, you know, it really becomes a steam trap database software because we can enter in the type of trap, we can enter in, you know, pipe size, orifice size, and then another piece of information is we can take a photo of the steam trap itself. Uh, and I would recommend if you have a trap that has a nameplate on it, 
Um, you know, you can take multiple photos with the ultra probe. So you, maybe you could take a trap, uh, take a picture of the trap itself and then take a photo of the nameplate. So you can kind of see how the UltraTrend DMS software really becomes a database for all of your steam traps. So we want to make sure that we make contact with the stethoscope module on the outlet or the, or the discharge orifice of the steam trap. So that's where we're going to be able to hear exactly what that steam trap is doing. Uh, and the source of the ultrasound is going to be turbulence. So when that steam trap opens and releases condensate, and then we're going to hear it shut back, but that release of condensate creates turbulence, and that's what we hear uh, with the ultra probe. Or if the trap is supposed to be closed, and we know that if the trap is closed, we shouldn't hear much of anything on the outlet or the discharge orifice of the trap, but if we hear an intermittent bypass of steam, that again creates turbulence, and that's what we hear, so that trap would be leaking by. So then we squeeze the trigger, uh, once we have made contact, squeeze the trigger, and that's going to give us uh, the decibel level and then the temperature reading. So we'll do that on the inlet and the outlet side of the trap. So our input data icons for the STEAM application are going to be test result. So was the trap okay? Was it leaking by? Was it failed open? Was it not in service? Uh, we have a field for inlet temperature, outlet temperature the manufacturer, the model, the application, what is the steam trap being used for, the type of trap, the pipe size, and then the orifice size. And again, all of that is, can be entered uh, using the input data icon. So again, if you scroll through here left and right, uh, you'll see orifice size and then all the other, uh, these other features and uh, pieces of information that we can enter in. Uh, and then once we save that data, that's going to save all that data, you know, your inlet temp, your outlet temp, and then all those other um, specifications and fields, saves it and links it all together, and then it will advance forward to the next trap. So for the steam trap cost report, uh, this is exactly what we need to know to generate that report, because based off of what we enter in here, um, this is what will then be used to generate the cost report that will give us the dollar amount for how much that trap is costing if it's leaking by or failed open. So we need to know the type of trap. We need to know the orifice size. Uh, now, we've been told that if you don't know the orifice size, well, one, you can do an internet search uh, for the make and model of that trap and see what the orifice is. Um, but also, if, it, if it's still unknown, we can estimate based off of pipe size, and then if we still don't know, then we can default and use one-eighth of an inch. So evidently, one-eighth of an inch is a, the most common uh, orifice size for a steam trap. Now, we need to know the inlet temperature and the outlet temperature because with steam, the temperature equates to a pressure. So if we know the orifice size and we know the temperature or the pressure, then we know that there's going to be a leak rate uh, in pounds per hour across that orifice. So that's why we need to know the inlet temp and the outlet temp. And then we need to know the operating condition. Uh, was the trap okay, or did we determine based off of our testing with temperature and ultrasound, was it failed open, was it leaking by, or maybe the trap wasn't in service? And again, we can enter all this information right on board the Ultra Probe 15,000. And then the last piece of information, we need to know the cost of steam. So how much it's uh, costing us to generate a thousand pounds of steam. So once we download that information from the Ultra Probe into the Ultra Trend DMS software, with just a couple of clicks, we get a report like this. So again, based off of our parameters, based off of what we determined, uh, it will tell us how much that trap is costing if we have some that are failed completely open or some that are leaking by. So uh, now the report is going to default to if the trap is failed open, if we determine that it's failed open, um, we assume that it's failed open 100%. If it's leaking by or if we determine that it's leaking by, then the default percentage is it's going to be leaking by at 50%. Now, if we really want to make this a little more conservative, we could change these to say, okay, we if it's blowing by, we're going to assume that it's blowing by at say 80%, and if it's leaking by, it's only blowing by or it's only leaking by at 40%, and that in turn will change your cost. But 
you can see that it'll give you the dollar amount for um, the cost. So again, that's based off of your cost of steam. And I believe for this report, I think we were using uh, it was either 10 or $12 per thousand pounds. But, you know, just over 10 traps, you know, we've got a roughly $6,000 uh, reported here. Um, and that's just over 10 traps. So uh, good rule of thumb, too, is if it's been longer than three to five years uh, since you've had a steam trap survey done, it's pretty safe to say that at least 50% of your traps have a problem, either leaking by or failed open. So uh, again, depending on how much, how many traps you have and how much it's costing you to generate uh, your steam, could have some significant savings and payback uh, pretty quickly. Okay, another application that we can enable on the Ultra Probe is the valve application. So we can set up valve routes in the DMS software. The recommended frequency setting for valve testing is 25 kilohertz. It's also a contact application, so using the stethoscope module. And you follow what we call the ABCD testing method to where we're comparing decibel level readings across four points on that valve. So when we enable the valve application, back on the home screen, we're gonna see an additional icon out here. So you'll see, uh, here's your Bluetooth, and then right beside the Bluetooth icon, you'll see the valve icon. So when you go into that valve icon, you'll then see here on your uh, DB display, you'll see A, B, C, D. So to take these different readings across those four points, we just simply touch A, and we're gonna make contact a little further upstream of the valve, squeeze the trigger, get the decibel level, and then release the trigger. And then we're gonna touch B, and we're gonna make contact a little closer to the inlet, and we're gonna do the same things to get the decibel level, and then we're gonna to touch C and then touch D. And what we're doing is we're comparing four, uh, or comparing decibel level readings across four points. Now then for the valve application, uh, the input data options are the test result. Was the valve leaking by? Was it okay? Uh, what were the temperature readings? So we can also take temperature readings. Uh, there's no extra effort in doing that. You've got your DB and temp display. The application, what is the valve being used for? The pressure, and then again, the pipe diameter, and then the type of valve. And we can then save all that information, and then it'll link it all together, and then advance forward to the next point. So why are we comparing decibel level readings across four points. Well, again, it has to do with turbulence, just like with steam traps. So if we have leakage across a valve, so if we have flow that's going through there, but it's being restricted through a smaller orifice on the outlet side of the valve, that creates turbulence. So if we see uh, where our higher decibel level is coming from our C point, then the valve is leaking by. Now, if the decibel level attenuates or goes down from A to D, then the valve is closed. If the decibel level readings are the same across all four points, it means the valve is open. It means that we have no change in turbulence across that valve. So, therefore, our decibel level readings will be the same across all four points. Now, if our D reading is the highest decibel level reading, it means that the noise is coming from further downstream of the valve. If A has the highest decibel level reading, then the sound is coming more from upstream of the valve. But again, if the valve is leaking by, C will be our highest decibel level reading. Okay, next is airborne electrical and then structure borne mechanical. Uh, airborne electrical is an application where I've seen uh, a huge increase in usage, um, and really what's driving it is safety. So if we are scanning first with ultrasound and we're listening for any potential fault like corona tracking or arcing, and we can hear that fault without having to open up that panel or cabinet, then in a sense, we're reducing the risk or the chance of an arc flash. So from simply from a safety point of view, uh, it's become a very, very um, big application for ultrasound. 
Uh, part of what's driving it too, you now have rec recognized standards such as NFPA 70B, which deals with electrical maintenance, which recommends the use of ultrasound and infrared together. Uh, but either way, uh, again, the same attachment, the same instrument we can use uh, for airborne electrical scans. And then we can diagnose exactly what it is that we're hearing. So uh, I mentioned, you know, corona tracking and arcing. Each one of those have signature, signature characteristics that we look for in either the time waveform or the FFT. So it's going to be very important to make use of the onboard sound file recording. And then we can, uh, once we hear something, we can then diagnose exactly what it is. So we're going to enable the leak application. Again, that's in the setup and then application. And then you'll scroll down and you'll see the electrical application. And then our recommended frequency setting for airborne electrical inspection is 40 kilohertz. We'll go into the DB display using the same concepts as the gross to fine approach to scan large areas, uh, just like we did for compressed air leak detection. And then uh, ideally, we want to try to get as close to the equipment as possible. So in most cases, we're going to start out using the rubber focusing probe, turn up, turn up the sensitivity a little higher, and, uh, and we just simply scan any openings. So the seal on the door, louvers, vent openings. So we're scanning prior to opening up for any kind of further inspection. And then our input data options for the electrical application are the test results. So uh, if what we heard was, was it corona, was it tracking, was it arcing, partial discharge, mechanical looseness, we do have the, the ability to enter temperature. So we want to use our spot radiometer to take some temperature readings. Uh, we can enter that information. Uh, if we have a device that's going to measure the humidity, uh, we carry that with us. If we want to test the humidity, we can enter in that. The voltage, uh, so uh, what is the voltage of the component that we're listening to? Uh, and then what we can specify what it, what it is. Is it a motor control center? Is it a switchgear? Is it a transformer? And then the location, uh, where is this piece of equipment? So we can enter all that information for that point. And then once we're ready to save that, we just simply hit the save icon and that'll save all that information, link it all together, and then advance forward to the next point. Now, when we hear something with ultrasound, now I should say, I should start with this. You know, if we don't hear anything with ultrasound, it doesn't mean that we don't have to do an infrared scan. It just means that there are no faults creating high frequency sound detectable with an ultra probe. Uh, but you can have resistance-based faults, which will produce heat, but no sound. And then in turn, you can have ionization-based faults, which produce sound, but no heat. So the example there is corona. Uh, corona typically doesn't produce enough heat that's detectable with a standard infrared camera, but we can hear it with ultrasound. So when we hear something, we want to make use of the uh, onboard sound recording feature. So we go in here to the FFT icon, and uh, once we do, in this case, we're seeing the FFT up top, the time waveform down below, and you'll see here that you have the universal symbol for record. Uh, so we'll simply record that sound file. Now, if we haven't changed it, the default setting for the sound file recording is one minute. So if we hit record, and it's going to record automatically for one minute, and then it'll pop up, it'll say save WAV file, yes or no, and we would just hit yes, and then we uh, exit out back out to our DB or DB intent display, and then you'll see that it has advanced forward to the next point. Uh, now we can, uh, as far as the, the time on the sound file recordings, we can change that in increments of five seconds up to 30 seconds or we can leave it in the default setting, which is manual, and therefore it would record automatically for one minute. Uh, but when we record a sound file, it really does two steps in one. So it stores not only uh, the sound file, but it also stores any photos. So any photos that we've taken, uh, the decibel level, and the sound file recording, and it links all that together and advances forward to the next point. 
Now for the electrical application, uh, one of the reports that I like the best here is this four pick report. Uh, it's really a multimedia report that incorporates up to four images, the current ultrasound data, and then up to four sound files. So you can see here that we've incorporated uh, an infrared image. Uh, here's an image from the Ultra Probe 15,000, which overlays all of your information. So the machine name, the point name, the decibel level, the date, the time, et cetera. Uh, here's a, uh, the digital image from the FLIR camera. But we can dump those images from any source into UltraTrend DMS, and we can use those images to then create application-specific reports. Uh, so in this case, this is, is, is an example of the four PIC report. Uh, and this is available for the electrical application as well as the bearing application. All right, so the last application before we kind of wrap up here and, and take any questions, um, and that's going to be structure born mechanical. Uh, again, very complementary to the existing use of vibration analysis, um, very effective on slow speed assets that currently aren't being monitored by vibration analysis. It can also be used as a standalone tool. Um, you know, we don't recommend a single technology approach. You know, you really want to make use of a multi technology approach, but not every plant, not every facility has the luxury of having a level three vibe analyst to go out and take vibration data on all the rotating equipment. So uh, it can effectively be used as a standalone tool. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, overall DB is a good leading indicator of a problem. And then if you're making use of contract maintenance, so if you want to leave that up to the experts, you know, the people that have invested in training and, and the data collectors, but in turn, you can have something in house to use in between that time that the service provider comes in. It can also be used very effectively in that method. So as before, uh, we would go into the setup and then applications and then enable the bearing application. Uh, there's no extra effort in taking decibel level and temperature readings. When we squeeze that trigger, we're going to get both. So that temperature is just another parameter of information that we can use to trend and monitor. The recommended frequency setting for mechanical or bearing applications is 30 kilohertz. For slower speed bearings, I would say anything below 100 RPM, you might would want to tune that lower to, say, 20 to 25 kilohertz. It's usually nothing in between. It's usually uh, either 20 or 25. And then we're going to make contact. Uh, so if you have a motor, it's going to be a motor outboard, motor inboard, and then whatever's attached to that motor. We're going to squeeze the trigger, release the trigger to hold that information on the screen, and then we can proceed to, to do other things. So if we want to do the sound file recording or if we just simply want to store or save that data. Now, for the bearing application, uh, our input data options are the test result. Uh, was there a problem? Did we lubricate it? Uh, or, you know, again, whatever problem we want to specify there. The temperature, we can input in the RPM, and then the type of bearings. And again, once we have specified the information that we need to, we've gotten our decibel level, our temperature, um, any photos that we want to take, we can then save that using the save icon, and then it will link all that information together and advance forward to the next point. Or we can record the sound file like we did for those electrical anom anomalies that we heard. So for the best practice for starting out with structure borne and mechanical inspection, I would recommend that you start out small with your routes. Uh, we typically will teach uh, no more than about 150 or so what we call touches or you know places, physical locations where we will make contact to take a reading. But you'd want to base or set up your route based off of asset criticality or you know specific equipment where bearing failures are causing unplanned downtime and establish your route off of that. So start out with some of your more critical components, your more critical equipment, and then you can branch out from there once you get that data going. We then load that route into the Ultra Probe and begin to acquire data, including the decibel level readings and the sound file recordings. So when we're taking those initial baseline readings, we wanna make sure that we get the decibel level and the sound file. And once we have taken those initial readings and we've set our baseline, 
Now, we'll say the UltraTrend DMS software defaults to the first reading you take and download into it. It sets it as the baseline, but we can change that baseline at any time. So then we go over to our alarms tab in the DMS software, and we want to set our alarm levels based off of uh, the delta values. And those recommended delta values are 8 dB for the low alarm delta, and then 16 dB for the high alarm delta. And then you can just select update all alarms using the deltas, and that would update your entire route using 8 above and 16 above. And again, 8 above is going to indicate a lack of lubrication. 16 dB above is going to indicate a, uh, a change has taken place, meaning that the bearing is in a failure mode that's beyond lack of lubrication. So some sort of bearing wear or damage has begun at that point. So once every, you know, once we've set up that route, once we've set our baselines, um, from there forward, it's storing decibel level readings only. The only time that we really need to record a sound file again is when that point reaches an alarm level. So when we have the alarm feature enabled on the Ultra Probe 15000, if we're out collecting data and if we reach a point that's currently an alarm, the decibel level will flash in red, meaning that the point is an alarm. So that's going to prompt us to record us another sound file. And then we can overlay those two sound files in the UE Spectralizer software. Uh, so that's probably the feature that I like the most in Spectralizer is the FFT overlay. So you can have up to four of those on the screen at the same time. So it's a great way to compare four identical points on four identical machines, or it's a great way to compare your baseline sound file to your current reading. So then the application specific reports that are available in the UltraTrend DMS software. Uh, so we've gone out, we've collected all this data. Now what do we do with it? So we can then generate an alarm report that'll give us everything that's currently in the low and the high alarm. We have a bearing lube route report if we want to know just the points that need to be lubricated. We have a master route report. So if you want to print this out uh, just as a guide to give to someone as they're out taking the readings, uh, of course, when we load a route into it, it's going to tell us exactly where we are. But you can uh, uh, generate that master route report. I mentioned the four pick report uh, that is really a multimedia report. And then you have an everything report. Uh, now, you can uh, create a, a custom report that where you can select fields of information that you only want to see. So if you only want to see the machine name, the point name, the baseline DB, and then what the current DB is, then you can just generate a report that will give you that information. Uh, and that's easily done. Uh, and we can certainly provide assistance uh, to guide you through that. So just wrapping up here, um, you know, hopefully this has been uh, an educational um, presentation for those of you that are currently using an Ultra Probe 15000. Maybe you weren't aware of the input data icon and what that was for, or you know how to specify different applications or um, other things that you could do with the Ultra Probe. But it really is an easy to use tool where we can on the spot input in information that's specific to the equipment that we're currently testing. Um, you know, we can use the same device for a multitude of applications. And then, uh, you know, I will say one of the advancements over the last couple of years with ultrasound is the reporting feature. Uh, so again, we go out and we collect all this data, then what do we do with that data? So again, using that input data icon will allow you to on the spot enter information uh, specific to what it is that you're testing. And uh, um, something else I always like to kind of stress, again, goes back to one of the first slides, is we take those initial readings in the manual setting before we load the route in again to go out and take the next round of readings. We want to change that to automatic, and that will automatically set all those same adjustments, the frequency, the sensitivity, um, the application, uh, according to what we did on the first round of data. So before we take any questions, uh, I failed to mention in the beginning that, uh, you know, well, Maureen mentioned we're recording this, but if you would like a PDF copy of the slides that I used, uh, send me an email. I'll be glad to share those. Um, 
but Maureen, uh, not sure if we had any questions come in, but um, let's let's take a yeah, look. Yeah, we've here. got a we've got a few, so we'll take just a couple. We want to be you know aware of everybody's time, um, and then if we don't get to your question, we will for sure be following up um, offline with you guys. So thanks, uh, Adrian, for that. And um, okay, so real quick. Someone was asking, if you have a sound file stored for the baseline, will it be overridden if you record a new sound file? No, it will not. So uh, if you um, if you have a uh, sound file linked to, say, that base, whatever reading you make as your baseline, that, that is not going to go anywhere. Uh, it'll stay there until you... Change the baseline, which, you know, if, if, that, if that's the case, if you have a sound file linked to the reading that you change as your baseline, it's going to change that sound file that has become your baseline sound file. But no, it doesn't go anywhere when you record a new sound file. All right. Um, can you use ultrasound for door gaps in the automotive sector? Uh, you know what? That used to be a, a big application. Um, with some of the auto manufacturers. Um, you may even still see some videos and material out there. We used to make a, what's called a wind noise water leak kit, uh, where it was a multi-directional tone generator that they would um, place inside of the vehicle, close the door, and then they would use an Ultra Probe 9000 to scan, you know, windows and doors. And But, you know, that they don't really do that much anymore. Um, I know of a couple of manufacturers that, that still use that method of testing for wind noise and water leaks. Um, it, it's something that can be done, but is it used as much? No, not as much. All right. And then um, this is a good one real quick. So when you're setting up your route, how do you suggest that folks ensure you're taking a reading at the same point every time, regardless of who's using the uh, instrument? Yeah, that's that's a great question uh, you, because you do want to try to make it as repeatable as possible. Uh, so we make use or like to recommend using the grease fitting um, in places, especially where the grease fitting is not extended out very far from the bearing housing. So when you're using that grease fitting, not only are we testing in the same location every single time, but that ex that grease tube acts as like an extension of the contact probe. So uh, you can use that. Um, the only time you wouldn't want to use the grease fitting, again, is if it's extended any distance beyond the bearing itself, because by nature, high frequency sound is low energy. So the farther you are away from that source, the more that sound is going to attenuate or drop off. Um, I've seen people just as simple as a paint pen, and they'll mark a spot on the equipment where they want to test. We actually have uh, you can purchase from UE Systems mounting discs or mounting pads that actually say ultrasonic test point. So you can just simply epoxy those on, and then they'll that person will know exactly where they should make contact to take a reading. But yeah, good question. Cool. All right. Well, so Adrian's got his email address up there. As he said, we did record this. Um, there's still a few questions that we didn't get to, so I will be sure that we. Um, give you guys a phone call or, or shoot you an email to, to cover those answers for you. Um, and definitely, if you think of questions after the fact, you know how to get in touch with Adrian. Um, most everybody has my email address, I think, as well. So you can just respond to, to some of the messages I've sent out, um, and, and we'll be sure to, to take care of you. But I um, want to thank everybody for being on with us today. And Adrian, again, thanks to you. And uh, yeah, everybody have a great rest of the day, and you'll be hearing for us, from us, all right?